Life in the Fast Lane. I like this title you all have chosen. It's a, it's a good theme, and it really represents, I think, how we all feel in life. Don't you feel like you're in the fast lane? Whether, whether you even intended to be in the fast lane or not, you find that you're there. Now, you may have discerned, if you have not met me before, maybe you've discerned from my accent that I am not, I was not born and raised here in Kenya. You can tell that, right? And uh, so you will understand that I had a little bit of an adjustment when I first arrived here to Kenya. And one of the things they told me was that uh, when, if you're going to live here, you're going to need a car. I said, okay, no problem. I've been driving all of my life. It should not be any problem. But uh, let me just say that the way the traffic works here in Nairobi is not quite the same as what I'm used to uh, back in Maryland in the United States. In Nairobi, wherever you are is the fast lane. <laughs> and, uh, and if there was no fast lane, the people will be happy to make a new fast lane for you uh, it doesn't even matter if they're in a rush, in a hurry. Uh, people will be pushing you into the fast lane. And uh, sometimes you, you feel like maybe you're not completely prepared for the experience that is before you. And I have so many traffic stories I can tell you from my almost six years here, living here in Nairobi. But the story I want to begin with today is not really from traffic, but it does have to do with the fast lane. You see, there was a, a woman named uh, Sifan Hassan. Does anybody know that name? You know that name. Okay, so you know where I'm going with this. Okay, Sifan Hassan was uh, an Olympic runner. From, uh, she was running for the Dutch team. And she was widely anticipated, expected, and hoped, it was hoped that she would win three gold medals in the 2020 Olympics. It had never been done before, and she was determined that she would win the gold medal for the 1500 meter race, for the uh, five kilometer race, and the 10 kilometer race. But you know how it works in the Olympics. You, you have to qualify first before you're actually in the actual heat for the medal. Well, Safan Hassan was obviously one of the finest runners in the world, well prepared. She was fully expected to make it uh, to get the gold. But, and so the qualifying matches were just, they weren't, weren't even necessarily no one was concerned about whether or not she would qualify. The question was whether she would win the gold in the final heat or not. But life has a funny way of introducing unexpected circumstances into it. And that is, was true for Safan Hassan, and it is true for every single one of us. You know, we don't get into the race just to be in the race. And I love this youth group here at New Life Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Nairobi because to come up with a theme like this theme, Life in the Fast Lane, tells me that you all are interested not just in being in the race. You're interested in figuring out what do I have to do to win the race? And I praise God for that. That was the mentality that Safan Hassan had as she began. And the gun goes off and everybody takes off and they're running uh, for this heat. Now, when you're qualifying and you know you're one of the best, you don't always have to really uh, overexert yourself because you want to save your energy for the final, actual final race, right? But you want to do what you can to make sure that you do qualify and you're looking at the other racers around you and you're running, keeping up a good pace. 
And Sifan Hassan was doing exactly that. Uh, but what happened next, no one expected. It was another racer, I believe it was uh, a racer from Korea, had fallen, tripped and fell, and got into Safan Hassan's way. And before we knew it, the whole crowd gasped. Even on people watching television, they gasped as the favorite, the one who was expected to win the gold, tripped over the runner who had fallen in front of her. And now she's on the ground. Not only is she not going to win the gold, she might not even get into the race itself. What Safan Hassan needed in that moment, more than anything else, was she needed resiliency. She needed the ability, the power, the strength, a mechanism by which she could take the fall and still come back. And isn't that the same way it is for you and me in life? You know, the Bible says that there is no one perfect. No, not even one. The Bible says that every single one of us has fallen. We start the race well, beautiful little children, welcomed into the world. And we have high hopes and high dreams. And many times, as it was with Safan Hassan, sometimes it is with us. Through no fault of our, of our own, maybe somebody else stumbles and falls and gets in our way. Maybe there are circumstances with the economy. Maybe there are uh, any number of things that can happen with school or finances and all kinds of things that can happen. And you find yourself hope, having hoped to go for the gold in life to get to the highest level of accomplishment and achievement. You've been dreaming for this, you've been praying for this, you've been training for this, and all of a sudden, you find yourself on the ground, struggling, figuring out what are you going to do next. We all need resiliency. The definition of the word resilience. I looked it up. It says, the, the, it gives, the dictionary gave two definitions for us. The first one says, resiliency is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. Another word for it would be toughness. Another definition says that, that it is the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into its original shape, resilience. Both of these definitions have within them this idea of recovery. It presupposes an understanding of an environment that is not perfect, an environment that is threatening to your goals and your intentions. It's an environment that is hostile to the intentions and the dreams that you have. You know, the Bible actually does not contemplate that we're gonna come into the world and we're going to, as long as you're good, as long as you do all the right things, you should have smooth sailing. You will not find that idea anywhere in the Word of God. The, Jesus himself says that in this world, you will have trouble. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6, 16 says that a righteous man or a righteous woman falls seven times. The idea is that the righteousness not, is not in the falling of seven times, but it is in the getting up. And the fact that we're still able to recognize this man or this woman as a righteous man or a righteous woman is not to presuppose that they never fell. It's not to presuppose that they never had a problem. It is to understand that everyone has a problem. Everyone falls. But the one who is righteous is the one who is recognized as the one who was resilient. 
who is able to get up and continue along the way towards victory. The subject of our story, Safan Hassan, she fell, and everyone knows, in a short race, like a 1,500-meter race, there's really not much time for recovery. And yet, Safan Hassan picked herself up off the ground. The whole crowd had already moved ahead significantly. She picked herself up, and she was unwilling to let go of her vision, unwilling to let go of her dreams. And she went on and caught up with the crowd, and not only caught up with the pack, but she made it to qualify for the final race. She went on in that Olympics to win two of the three gold medals that she had been seeking. That's resilience. And that's one of the reasons I love the Olympics. There are so many stories like that. But the Olympics is really, it's games, right? But we're not talking about games. We're talking now about life. And I want to share a few things with us that are very, very, very important. Maybe there are some misconceptions that we need to clear up if we really want to understand the kind of resilience that God is willing and able to support you through. God's intention is that you and I, that all of us will be not just runners in the race, but that we will be champions in the race of the life that he has given us. You see, all of us are going to face trouble in the world. All of us. We're not comfortable in this world. And if you are comfortable in this world, then I want to suggest that it's probably because you simply are not paying attention. God designed us to live in a different kind of world for the, from the world that we're living in now. When you go all the way back to the, to the story of creation, to the historical account of creation, you will understand that God designed us, humanity, to live in a perfect world. Every day of those six days where God was creating the elements of, the, of this world and the universe, every day God checked and he evaluated, and God himself said it was good. And when he concluded all of that work, he even went on to say, now, this is very good. God designed humanity. All right, let's see. Okay, it's back. God designed humanity to live in a world like that. But we find that because of the fall, because sin entered into the world, you and I, through circumstances not of our own making, we're living in a world that is hostile to the intention of reaching the gold in life, of getting to the highest level of performance. You should not be comfortable here. You were designed to live in a perfect world where there are no tears, where there is no suffering. There's no one that cheats in the world that God designed you for. No one that lies. There is no rape. There is no murder. There are no famines. There are no floods in the world that God designed you and me for. But we find ourselves in a world full of, of all of those things and so much more. You can find in this world that even if you do everything right, you will still end up with problems. How many people know what I'm talking about? It happens. People start a relationship. They start a marriage with the best of dreams with the highest of hopes, saying, no, 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 you are the one. And, 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 and the one that you love comes back, she, she responds or he responds, no, 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 you are the one. And I love you so much. You mean everything to me. <laughs> oh, darling, the, what, what you have done for me, you've changed my life. There's a movie 
with uh, Tom Cruise in it. I believe it's Tom Cruise. And there's this great line where he says, you complete me. You know that? Huh? That was good stuff. Man, I wrote that one down. <laughs> that was good. I said, I'm going to use this line. Hopefully she hasn't seen the movie yet. <laughs> but we start off so well. Am I right? Some of us have children. You heard I have six children, right? I, I, I didn't learn my lesson after the first time. So... <laughs> But no, I no, seriously, I love children. I love especially my children. Um, but I love children so much. But we start off, and this precious child, oh, you love them and they're perfect. And every word they say to you is, is the word from heaven itself. <laughs> Only God could invent that. Am I right? That is just, thank you, Jesus, for that word, <laughs> you know. It's powerful. It's powerful, you know? And, and, and I mean, and that is a word that changes your life more than any preacher could ever do, right? When, the minute you hear that, you're like, oh, my life has changed forever. Pastors are preaching, and you can't remember tomorrow what they said yesterday. So we start off so well, and then you wonder, you find yourself struggling, arguing with a teenager about something and doors are slamming and you, you're wondering what in the world can this be the same child that we gave birth to so many years ago how this world is against the dreams that God himself has placed in your heart don't ever be embarrassed or ashamed that in your heart you desire greatness that you desire excellence God himself put that into your heart. That your marriage, that your family should be a perfect family. God put that there. If you want to be the best in the world at whatever it is that you do for your work or for your career, listen, let me tell you what. God himself put that vision in your heart. It should be nurtured. It should be cherished. But along the way, we have to understand that the enemy is going to put things in our way to cause us to stumble and fall. And the Lord himself knows that, and he's still reminding you that a righteous man or a righteous woman, a holy person, someone that meets the standard of God's expectation of you and me in this world, even they will fall seven times. This is why Jesus answered when his disciples asked, how many times should I forgive my brother when they sin against me? Should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus comes back and says, no, you forgive them 70 times seven times. Everyone faces trouble. Resilience is only desirable because we know that the world is difficult. It's only desirable because God has placed something in you and he's placed something in me that wants that original perfection and greatness and purity that God himself created you for. But we find that we're in this world. My father used to tell me when I was young, he used to, he used to tell me, I get, this was his version of a pep talk. He told me that, um, and he still has these great stories today, but he said, from the, the minute you were born, my son, the entire world is out to get you. He said, the moment you're born, the entire planet is trying to destroy you. He says, there are bacteria that want to give you diseases and viruses, and they are out to kill you. The street we live on will kill you if you're not careful. You have to put in extra effort just to survive another day in this world. Don't think that you can just be here and coast through life 
and expect that you will survive. This world will destroy you. It is not made for your comfort. You're going to have to fight for your survival. And so I love the way that you have put the theme for this week and the theme for today. For today. The theme for today is resilience through faith understanding how spiritual strength helps navigate personal and social challenges like family cha challenges, material success, and so on. My friends, today I want to give you a gar the guaranteed formula. I'm telling you guaranteed formula for total resilience in your life. If you follow this, you have nothing to fear. You will be a champion, and we're gonna build on this throughout the week. I want us to understand, the first thing about resilience is this. If you understand that you're living in a hostile environment, then we have to also recognize that God is going to use that hostile environment somehow in your life. In other words, so often we are busy praying. When we pray to God and we're facing pressure and we're facing challenges, obstacles have fallen in our way and we find ourselves stumbling. We start praying and we ask God, God, can you remove the obstacle? Can you remove the problem? Can you have people just start treating me better? Can you can you have the economy get better? Lord, can you give me a raise? Can you settle these different circumstances that I'm having in my life? But see, resilience itself implies that I am going through the struggle, but that I will come out again on the other side victorious. This is why we love the 23rd Psalms so much, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We want to stay there in verse 1 of Psalms chapter 23, don't we? We want him to lead us beside still waters, right? He wants us, we want the Lord to lead us into the green pastures. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's, that's my place, right? But the shepherd is the one who is leading, right? Right? And we have to remember in life that the one who leads us beside still waters and the one who leads us into those wonderful, lush, green pastures is also the same Savior, the same shepherd who leads us into the valley of the shadow of death. And the question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, are we going to trust the shepherd? Or do we only trust the shepherd when he is giving us the things that we think that we like? Hmm? But when he leads me into the valley of the shadow of death, when I'm, when I'm struggling, I've got a conflict with my spouse, and I wish she would just come to recognize what, what I have known all along, which, which is that I am always right. I use only nobody. Oh, I think one person got that. Okay. When they don't recognize those things and I'm struggling to communicate, can I trust that the shepherd is still leading me and still leading my life? On the other side of the valley of the shadow of death, God's intention is not to leave us in that, sh in that valley of the shadow of death. The Lord's intention is to lead us through the valley so that we come out on the other side as resilient chap champions where the Lord himself will anoint our heads with oil, where the Lord himself will set a banquet table in, fr in front of us with our enemies looking on hungry, where well, they have nothing to eat, but they're sitting there. They thought that we would be their meal. But instead, the Lord has led us through the challenges to a place where he takes care of us, and he feeds us, and he provides for us, and we dwell in his house forevermore. 
This is the Lord's intention for us. It is the Lord's design for us to be resilient. But we should not make the mistake that God's design for us to be victorious, resilient champions does not also include going through those valleys. We want to be resilient, which means we have to endure pressure. Sometimes there's going to be some pain along the way in life. And that is because God himself is molding us. God himself is shaping us for the grander and greater purposes that he has for us in life. You see, a lot of times when we're praying for resilience and we are praying for success, we are looking for promotions on the job. We are looking for uh, extra money that we can have. We're looking for uh, better relationships. We're looking for all of those things. But sometimes we forget that we do not belong to ourselves. So we don't really design the purpose for our own lives. God himself has a purpose for our lives. We are not to conform ourselves to the course of this world, to the ways of this world. You see, the standards of success and the standards of what we think we should have are often designed by the culture around us, by the friends that we have, by our family members. Sometimes our family members want to tell us everything. Which career you should study in college, what job you should have when you get out of college, who you should marry, who you should not marry. They want to tell you everything. And there's nothing wrong. We love our families, and I think for the most part, our families mean well for us. But the standard and the measure of our life should not be measured by the influences around us, nor should the standard of our lives, the expectation of our lives be measured by even our own desires and our own concepts of what is success. We all know this. I don't have to really remind you, but I'll tell you, the Bible says that God does not judge us by how things look on the outside, does he? Right? Who does that? The world judges us from the outside by how we look and by what we wear. But God judges the hearts. He's looking at those internals, and I know it is challenging, it is difficult, and to many of us it seems even impossible that we would live a life that is fully dedicated and devoted to the mission and to the purposes of God. But my friends, this is what God is calling you and me to. In other words, we're not to live by the standards of the world. And so many times we come to the word of God, we come to church, asking God to help us to have success according to the things of this world. But you see, God's objective is not that we will have worldly success, success in this world in and of itself. God has called you and me on a different uh, mission. There's a different calling for you and me. When you, those of us that have children, you know that when you are raising a child, the child may want a lot of things. But they oftentimes want things that are not really in line with your vision and your purpose for their good. A child may want only ice cream, only sweets all their life. But you, as a parent, you know that that is not in their best interest. And so you try to guide them and teach them and tell them, no, eat your vegetables, drink your water, 
Go out and get some exercise. Don't sit in front of the television uh, all day. Do your schoolwork. Read a book. And we're always encouraging them. Why? Because we have their ultimate best interest in mind. God also has that for you and me in mind. So how do we do this? What does it mean to focus your life so that you can be resilient in a way that God himself, where you have his support every step of the way? Well, I think we can see a few examples. I want to begin all the way back in Genesis. I want to touch on that and we'll use some examples then from Scripture. In Genesis chapter 1, God says that he created mankind, men and women, in his image. Therefore, it means that the purpose of our life, the goal of our lives, is to represent him in the world and to display his glory in the world. This is God's purpose for you and me. So with that objective in mind, let's look at your life and my life. Let's look at some examples. We can look in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a leader who was given a calling by God to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, we don't have time tonight to go into his entire story of how he was resilient and was able to achieve the goal. But our purpose tonight in bringing up that example is to understand that Nehemiah, when he heard the story that the walls of God's city were broken down, that the gates of God's city were burned, Nehemiah felt a burden in his heart and he wanted to do something to restore the walls of Jerusalem. Of Jerusalem. So that God's city would not be in shame in the world. He wanted to restore the image of God's mission and God's purpose in the world. And so Nehemiah was able to do something that really would have been considered really impossible if he had gone around asking people, do you think I can do this? You don't need to get anyone else's uh, uh, approval once you have a calling from God his, himself. When your vision, when your desire and your mission is aligned with the mission of God, with the purposes of God, that is the time when God moves alongside with you and you have access to all of the power of heaven itself to promote you through all of the obstacles, all of the challenges that will see you through the valley and see you through on the other side as victorious. What are we saying? It's that we cannot expect God's full support in our lives unless our lives are first fully aligned with his vision, with his mission, with his kingdom. And very often we can find ourselves praying for the Lord's support, not for his vision, but for ours. In the book of James, we read, James says that you do not have, right? You know this verse. It says, you do not have because you do not do what? Because you don't ask. You don't ask God. We ask our friends. We ask our neighbor. We ask our parents, should I do this? Should I try that? But we have not asked God, Lord, what is your will for my life? What is the direction that you have for my life? And we've got to be careful when we ask that question of God. Don't ask God questions that you do not want the answer to. God may give you the answer, an answer, that is not the one that you were expecting. Imagine if Joseph, from the book of Genesis, had asked God, 
Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Well, Joseph, I'm, Joseph, I'm glad you have asked me that. I know you've been being trained very well by your father, uh, and uh, I know you're planning to become a leader of your clan, of your tribe here, so um, no problem. Joseph, let me tell you the plan. The plan is step one, and Joseph is saying, yes, Lord, please, I'm ready. Anything, I've, I've prepared, I've been very obedient, I know everything my father has taught me. You just tell me I'm ready. And God says, yes, um, what I want you to do, I want you to go to a foreign country as a slave without your family. Ah. Now, if the Lord had told Joseph that, what, would, what do you think Joseph would have said? Joseph might easily have wrestled with God, right? He said, hey, look, Lord, I, I want to serve you, okay, but slavery, I'm not sure I'm cut out for that. Well, no, 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 uh, Joseph, don't worry. I'm not finished. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> what else do you have for me, Lord? Well, Joseph, after you're finished with your stint as, as a slave, uh, I want you to be a prisoner. <laughs> now, at that point, many of us would even stop asking God questions. Am I right? Lord, you know what? I don't think I need to know any more plans. I think, let me just work this out on my own. I'm going to go to university, see what kind of job I can get. And uh, I know a few people. My father's a little bit connected. Let's see if I can, you know, make some steps. And, you know, after I get on my feet, Lord, I'll come back. I'll check with you. We've got to be careful. What is it that God himself is calling you to? What has he created you for? Nehemiah understood that the kingdom of God and his image in the world was in jeopardy and he wanted to do what he could. So he left his comfortable, very well, highly respected job in the palace of the emperor and decided to go where he was not invited, he was not welcome, and where there were problems every single day. He went there. Why? Because it was for the glory of God. Are you willing to go where Jesus says go? When he calls you to go somewhere, when he invites you, are you willing to accept his vision for your life? It may not seem glamorous to you or to me. It may not be something that impresses your parents or your friends. But when you go on God's errands, when you're going because God himself has called you, my friends, it is, you have to remember who it is that is, is leading you there. You see, if you go on your own, you will face the valley of the shadow of death anyway. Everyone faces it. Everyone. But when you go because the shepherd has called you to go, guess what? The good shepherd goes before you. Every step of the way, he has been there before you got there. And it might not seem comfortable to you, but you need to know he is there with you. And he has promised he will never leave you, nor forsake you. God himself will be there. So the first thing I want to say about how to be resilient is we will fail to be resilient if the mission that we have and the purpose or the objective that we have is not God's objective in the first place. If, you, if faith is to help us to be resilient in the world, then the direction we're going and the place we're headed must be God's direction. My friends, has God chosen for you the person that you are dating? Has God chosen for you the person that you are planning to marry? Are you engaged in this relationship because you have prayed 
and you have seen that the walls of Jerusalem are broken, that the gates have been, been, have been burned, and that God has a place for you to go there and serve the kingdom of God by serving this person. And that somehow together, the two of you will be able to build those walls together. Is that the calling that you are on? My brother and sister, that is not a calling from God. Then you are at risk of entering into something where you will not have the Lord, the Lord's full uh, resources to help you to be resilient in the difficult times. Now, maybe you're already married. Maybe you've already taken that job that the Lord did not call you to. It's just the one that your parents liked, or it's just the one that had a great salary attached to it. It's the one that had a great title attached to it, and you thought, okay, well, I'll take this job. Maybe you're already there. Maybe you've already made a a decision that has put you someplace. Hmm. We've all been there. We've all done that. I want you to know the Lord does not abandon anyone. But the decisions we make do have consequences. And so once we are there in a certain situation, thank God the Bible says that the Lord works all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. Amen? The Lord will not abandon you. He will never leave you. This is a God of grace. This is a God of mercy. And he will take the things that are are, are the most uh, unexpected and the most unfortunate things, and he has a way of being able to polish those things up. He has a way of being, being able to clean those things up where you will end up in a place where you were wondering, wow, where you would say, Lord, even if I could change what happened in the past, Lord, I wouldn't change a thing because it has brought me to this place here with you today. My friends, resilience for the believer is resilience according to the kingdom of God. We cannot expect the Holy Spirit to come and bless a worldly plan. He comes to bless his plans in our lives. And and, and this is faith. This is belief. Faith and belief is trusting and believing that God's plan for you is exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that you could ever ask or even imagine. I know your plans sound good. I know that they look good. But God has something even better. We need to make up in our minds if we want to be resilient that we're going to go in God's direction and no other direction, no matter how it looks. The Bible, every story in the Bible is telling us this over and over and over again. Abraham, sacrifice your son. Will you trust me? God is saying. And I was amazed when I was in Israel, and I, and I, I, because I had not understood this before, but that temple mount where the holy place of the temple is there, it is understood that that same place is the place where Abraham brought his son to be sacrificed. In other words, God himself knew when he called Abraham that God himself would also sacrifice his son, that the blood of his own son would be offered up for your sins and for my sins one day. My friends, let me tell you something. What does that mean? I mean, it is foundational to the Christian understanding of the world that Jesus gave his life to redeem us from our sins. But let's take another step back. What does it mean for the Father? What it means, what does it mean for you and me? It means 
that you can trust this God. There is nothing that he's going to ask of you. There's no place he's going to lead you to that will ever mess up your life. No, he loves you too much. And the proof of it is that he has already sacrificed. If you think the calling he's leading you on will ever be a sacrifice, don't worry. He is already there ahead of you. He has already sacrificed and suffered so that you don't have to. God will never make a mistake. He will never mess up your life. I promise you, he will never mess up your life. He's already paid too high a price for you to succeed. He's paid too high a price for you to be a champion. When Jesus accepted the call, and he was seen in Matthew chapter 4 coming to be baptized. After he's baptized, the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And you, know, you remember what happens next? The Bible says that the spirit led him out where? Into the big city to get a nice job? Hmm? No, no, no. Oh. The Lord loves Jesus so much. His Father loves Jesus so much. He says, listen, Jesus, <laughs> I have prepared this special little woman. Ah, everybody wishes he could have her, but no, 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 Jesus. Because you've been faithful, because you've been sinless, here she is. Is that what the Spirit did? My friends, because the Lord loves you, precisely because the Lord loves you, sometimes we have to trust him now. We have to trust him now. Sometimes we have to know that the Spirit himself is going to lead you into the wilderness. Because it is part of his grand mission and calling for your life. Jesus was willing to go into the wilderness when he could have gone anywhere and done anything else. Jesus was willing to go. And now, as a result, Jesus holds the name that is exalted above every name. Amen? If you want to have resilience and be able to get through the problems and the challenges of life, don't wait until you get into the problem and then try to figure out, well, Lord, start searching scriptures. Lord, how do I get out of this problem? No, no, no. The way to avoid the problem, you avoid it from the very beginning by saying, Lord Jesus, I will trust you in everything. Every step of my life, I will trust you. And out there in the wilderness, the enemy himself is going to come. And the enemy is going to say, you know what? You don't have to put up with this. Has the enemy ever said that to you? You don't have to deal with the way these people are treating you. Don't they know who you are? No. You know what? Why don't you use your own strength? You use your own power. You take this stone here and you turn that stone into bread. You deserve it. I mean, after all, who's ever fasted for 40 days? No, no, no. Have some bread. Enjoy it. And there's so many times in our lives when we can fix our own problem, we think. We can medicate ourselves. We try drugs. We try alcohol. We try sex. Hmm? We try money. We try going shopping and doing all these different things to make us feel better. Trying to turn, turn stones into bread because we're struggling. Because we want our own version of resilience. And our own version of resilience says, my life should be on the track that everybody else's life is on. You see, Jesus could have said, no, 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 no. I remember my friend over here, and uh, we went to school together, and now, you know, he's a Pharisee. He's doing very well. My other friend, he's a doctor. He's got a lot of money, a lot of prestige. Lord, Father, I've never sinned. I've been faithful to you. I got baptized. And Lord, I've given my life to serve you. And Lord, I don't understand why I'm in the wilderness. So you know what, Lord, just forgive me. I, 
Look, I deserve at least a little bread. Have you ever been there? Do not, do not, do not try to save yourself. Surrender to God. Give him the glory. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall not live by the indicators of success that you think you have in your mind. You shall not live by them. And when you commit yourself to walk in the ways of the Lord, to walk in the way of righteousness, let me tell you something, you cannot fail. There's no such thing as I don't have the resilience that I need. The enemy will come to you and say, listen, come and throw yourself down from the highest heights of the temple. And let's just see if the Lord really cares about you. The enemy is going to try to make you doubt. If you make that first decision that I'm going to trust God and go wherever he leads me, then the second thing the enemy is going to try to do is come to make you doubt whether or not the Lord is truly with you or not. Joseph could have doubted, Lord, why did you make me a slave? I, you gave me these visions and dreams. You made me want to be the leader, and now I'm a slave. I'm leading no one. Now I'm in prison. And the enemy's going to try to make you doubt that the Lord loves you. But if you want to be resilient, you have to remember who you are. And you've got to remember who or what the Lord has called you to. Your identity and your mission are essential. The enemy, if you get through those first two challenges, the enemy still has another one. And the enemy is going to say, well, I tell you what, I see that you know who you are. You understand your mission for the glory of God. Then the enemy is going to try to bribe you then. He's going to offer you some corrupt experience. The enemy told Jesus, just bow down. Bow down and worship me. Fine, if you want to save the world, no problem. I will give you the world. The, the world belongs to me. I will give you the world. Just bow down and worship me. And you won't have to go through all the struggle, all the people complaining about you, all the suffering. You will not have to be crucified and die. You won't have any of those troubles. I will just give you everything that you say that you want. Watch out for those things. Resilience is the simple thing. Keep your eyes on things above. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Trust his voice, the voice of the good shepherd alone. There are no shortcuts. In fact, it is walking through the valley of the shadow of death that actually prepares you for the glory that God has planned for you. Huh? Don't short circuit God's plan for you. Now some of us, sadly in the world, are going to say, no, Lord, if you want me, for example, myself, I never planned to be a missionary in Africa. And if you'd asked me when I was 15 or 20, I, I probably would, that would not have been high on my list. I probably wouldn't have been anywhere on my list. I wanted to come visit, but I didn't think I would live here. But now that I have been here, all I can do is just praise the Lord. All of my friends, maybe some of you don't know, but all of my friends, all of my friends, they said, listen, the church is calling you to go do what? Man, don't you know, you've worked hard. You've went to, you know, the most elite university in the United States. You've built a company. Man, you're doing well. I mean, you've got my money. You don't, you don't need anything. You've got respect, all these things. At your, no. You tell the church they can find someone else. This doesn't make sense. And for sure, I could not make any logical sense out of any of it. I could not. My friends, I don't know. But I said to myself, I remember, I remember clearly thinking, 
there are things that I want to see. I want to see the glory of God in my children's lives. I want to see God in my family. I want to see God in this world. I want to see my church grow and, and thrive and, 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 and be able to accomplish its mission in the world. How, Lord, can I pray, God, that you will bless your church, that you will bless my family, that you will bless me if when you call me, I refuse and I say no. My friends, the key to resilience is to make sure that you are walking with God in the first place. And if you've made a mistake, it's okay. Come back. Come back. The Lord is willing. He's inviting you. He's calling you to come back. And I do not regret for one moment giving up everything that I had to come to be here. It's been a joy. And you know what the problem I have now? My problem is, oh, Lord, please don't, don't ever let me leave. <laughs> you, I, I would never have imagined that. But God is so sweet and he is so good. You can trust him. Let me share with you one final thing. Our time is finished. But I, I don't think I can really mention anything about uh, resilience without mention, mentioning this one thing. Matthew. Um, in Matthew chapter 28, we see the ultimate example of resilience. The ultimate comeback, if you will. You see, Jesus himself gave his life for us. Jesus himself went to the cross for us. Now you and I, we will have failures and we will stumble. And people may come back from a failure at the job. You may come back from failing on a test. You may come back from a breakup in a relationship or even from a divorce. But no one in the world had ever seen anyone come back from death. But the beginning of Matthew chapter 28, verse 5, the, it says, but the angel answered and said to these women, these women had come to find Jesus just to anoint his dead body. And the angel said, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. My friends, when you do the will of God, no matter how much it seems that your dreams have ended, no matter how over it seems to be, no matter how beyond recovery people tell you you are, they may say, oh man, you're finished, you've really messed up, you yourself may even doubt. Ellen White says that Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he himself could not see through the grave. He just placed his life he tr entrusted his life to the Father, believing that the Father would resurrect him, but he couldn't see it himself. It may feel like that to you. This is why Jesus says, you and I have to take up our cross daily and follow him. The ultimate example of resilience is when you come back from death. So, as I close, I want to challenge you and me. There are many of us who have been baptized as members of the church. That baptism is a, is a symbolism. It is a, it is a ritual of resilience. It is a ritual of rebellion against the world that we are in. The world that's trying to destroy you, it's trying to finish you off. But when you get baptized, you go down into the waters of baptism representing the death to self. And the world rejoices, yes, I've destroyed her. Yes, I've destroyed him. But the beauty of this ritual of baptism 
is in this ritual of baptism is a personal declaration of faith that's saying, that says no matter what anyone has buried me under, no matter what I'm dealing with, no matter how dead the world thinks that I am, by the power that I do not have, God himself reaches down and pulls me up a victorious champion in the name of Jesus. That is baptism. It's a declaration that I believe that if I follow the word of God and the will of God and the plan of God for my life, there is nothing that can keep me down. And that's why one of my favorite passages is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse, starting with verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels in our bodies that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed. We don't understand everything. We don't always know what's going on. We can be confused. But the Bible says we are never in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus, the resilient, overcoming, championship life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. My friends, there are so many areas of our lives that we're going to talk about this week. And God has a plan for you to be resilient and for you to be an overcomer in every one of those areas areas but we will not come to God with our own standard of what we think success is we will come to him in humility and ask the spirit Lord what is it you would have of me my friends the world we're living in is in trouble and it is looking for a new kind of champion not one who is looking for success on the world's terms but one who is willing to go and to build up the broken down walls of the kingdom of God. Ones who are willing to restore the gates of Jerusalem. I pray that you and I and maybe thousands of others online will accept God's calling. You want resilience? It begins here. It begins with the Spirit of God. If you'd like to accept God's challenge to trust Him, then I'd like you to stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that no matter what we face in our lives, you have already gone before us. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you in every step of the way. Lord, we thank you that we cannot fail. No matter what the enemy brings against us, even death can never defeat us. We will always be resilient when we are found in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, now to understand more deeply what it means to trust you in relationships, in work, in service, in worship. Lord, help us to understand these things. And Lord, give us the faith to follow you. Lord, that the world may see that you are good. Lord, we thank you for these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.